Light of the Nations presents... So we want to thank God for them. Okay, I, we, I just want to get right into this. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. <clears throat> and uh, while you're doing that, let me just say one more time for you pastors. This might be a good thing for everybody to do, to be involved in. Uh, it's a good thing to sit around. I was reading um, Malachi 3.16. And Malachi 3.16 says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And uh, a book of remembrance was written for them. And so that's the difference between a monologue and uh, a dialogue. Because the concept of dialogos is that if people who fear the Lord speak often one to another, that God enters into the conversation and you come up with something that neither party brought to it. And, uh, and then God writes it down in a book of remembrance. What it, the concept is that what you begin to talk about, that God writes down to make sure that it gets done. Amen. You could have a revival in your church if you could just get some people who feared the Lord to get together. You could talk it into existence yes, if you could get together and speak about it. Okay, so anyway, so maybe think about doing that. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8. Can you guys just put it on the screen? That way I won't have to read it. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8, thus saith the Lord, the new wine is found in the cluster. Everyone say the new wine, the new wine. is found, found in the cluster. Yes. And one saith, destroy it not, for there is a blessing in it. Yes, the new wine is found in the cluster. Don't destroy it, because there is a blessing in it. I want to talk to you about this for just a, a few moments here and see where we can go with this. Because we hear a lot of talking about new wine. We understand the concept of not trying to put new wine into an old wine skin and all of these things. Uh, I thought about the concept of uh, on the day of Pentecost, the, the people in the town thought these men were drunk on new wine. The concept, not to spend much time teaching on it, is that the new wine was the first of a new harvest season. And since it was the first of a new harvest season, when someone was drunk, they would think they were drunk on new wine, was because with the old wine, you had become so accustomed to it that it didn't affect you so much, and you knew what the strength of it was. The new wine was that of such that it had not yet been tested or tasted, therefore it might, you don't know what the strength of it is, and so a person might get some of it and not know that it was going to be that strong. Uh, this is how it is in our churches many times. We're so used to the wine that is flowing. We're so used to the way that we're doing it until we've learned how to come to church and it doesn't affect us any. But when the new wine gets poured out, yes, yes, you're not used to that strength. You used to could sit through an hour service and be all right. But when the new thing hits, you find out it will mess up your world in a good way. This is the new wine. Now, there was a, a wedding at Cana of Galilee and... Uh, the mother of Jesus was there, and they had run out of wine. You guys know the story. They had run out of wine, and Jesus and his disciples come, and she says to him, uh, we're out of wine. We're out of wine. And I, I, I imagine that she kind of had that motherly look, you know, like, and I know you can do something about it. We're out of wine. I have raised you. I've been watching you, and I know you can do something about this. And Jesus gives her a theological answer and says to her, uh, mine hour hath not yet come. And she's like, yeah, right. Okay, now, whatever he tells you to do, <laughs> just do it. And I can, I can see her walking out the door like and looking at him like, I better see some wine coming through this door here in just a minute. I'm still your mother. So... Uh, so his disciples, you know, they take, they, take, they take the six, six number of man, stone, old covenant, we covered it last night, filled it up with water, turns it into wine, and 
two things that I think are significant is the first one is that the Bible said that when the governor of the feast tasted it, it was the best wine was last. It says that nobody knew where the wine came from except for the servants because they helped make it. You can come to a church and everybody's like, ooh, the anointing is thick, and they don't have a clue as to how it got there. But the servants of the house helped to create the stuff so they know where it came from. And then the, and then the Bible said, this was the beginning of miracles. This was the beginning, because that's why Jesus said, mine hour hath not yet come, because once this thing gets started, it ain't never going back. It ain't never going back. So when the anointing comes, uh, I believe one of the first miracles that needs to happen in our churches is Jesus turning our water into wine. That will be the first miracle that will begin a lifelong flow of miracles in your church. But here's the deal. The new wine is found in the cluster. The new wine is found in team ministry. It is found in a cluster. Not one grape, yeah. It's found in the cluster. It takes, it takes people to produce new wine. And destroy it not, for there is a blessing in it. Because sometimes when you're doing something new, you look like you don't know what you're doing. The reason is, is because you don't know what you're doing. And I have not felt a great pressure to always know what I'm doing. The Bible said Abraham left not knowing where he was going. Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. Why do I have to know everything? So, so sometimes when the anointing is in transition, it looks unstable. And that's because it's something new. But destroy it not. For there is a blessing in it. When the new wine, when you're doing something new in your church, whether it's a new way of doing something, whether it's the new flow of the Spirit, whether it's a new theology, philosophy, methodology, whatever it may be, whenever you're doing it, you have to struggle for your equilibrium. But destroy it not, for there is a blessing in it. You'll figure it out as you go, and you don't have to get it all figured out day number one. But don't shut it down because, it, because you're uncomfortable with it. Don't shut it down because you don't, you're not used to the strength of it. Don't shut it down because no man man, having tasted of the new wine, desireth it first, for he saith that the old wine is better. But that's not what the Bible tells us at the wedding of Canaan. Jesus always saves the best wine for last. So the new wine is found in the cluster. So we have to talk about this a little bit because here's what we do with our churches. I believe that when you're leading a church, you are the candlestick ministry uh, of the church. The dominant gift, the dominant gift is the candlestick that gives light to all that are in the house if you don't put it under a bushel a bushel is an inverted system it is something that's supposed to be used to hold the harvest the system the structure of the church is there to hold the harvest and if you invert it and get it upside down it becomes a bushel by which the candlesticks ministry no longer has the capacity to give light to all that are in the house and so it is the understanding that we should be structuring what we're doing so that the dominant gift is seen in the best lights rather than trying to stick the dominant gift into the existing structure. We cannot take new wine and pour it into an old structure. We have to have a structure that is set for where we are going. Um, especially a, a, a lady's wedding ring, if you, if you look at it, especially a lady's wedding ring has a dominant stone Many times it's a solitaire. Yeah? Please communicate. Yeah? It's a stone. And then the, there is a, uh, a structure that has like prongs on it. And what it is, the whole, the whole ring is set to put that stone in the best possible light. So, so what, we, what we have to do then is to see ourselves as leaders and then those who are around the leaders have to develop a structure by which the dominant gift is seen in the best possible light so that it can give light to all that are in the house. So one of the things that wears ministries out is they're not functioning. They're not being released. They're under a bushel. 
They're in a structure, they're in a system, sometimes of our own creating. We have created systems around where we have been rather than where we are going. And so now here you are trying to break free and to break out, but everything is holding you in yesterday, but we're about ready to shift into another dimension by which you can, you can design everything, in my estimation, everything should be designed around the main thing. And that means, that means the, the, everything from the music that is played to the lighting to the way the platform is built to what kind of microphones we're using. All of those things, all of those things need to be designed around the set man, woman of God that is in that house because the main thing is that if they are in their right place, they can give light to everybody that's in the house. And, and sometimes you have to come out of being overly spiritual about it and understand that I don't have to have a Bible verse for why you are on my nerves. If, if you get in the way of my anointing, that's reason enough for you not to be included because you bother me. So there, there are no Bible verses as to what time rehearsal should be, how long the service should last, where the usher should stand, where the cameras are. There are no Bible verses in that. There is no, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt bring the ushers forward with the pans in their hand. There's none of that in there. So somebody has to make a call. That would be me. So, so we have to understand then that what you're trying to do is set something up so that you can function, not out of some kind of egotistical thing, but you can help more people. I can, I, I can help people if I'm in my flow. Yes, if, if, if the anointing of God is on me and I can operate in the thing that God put in me, I'm going to help some people. If you pin me in, you might as well call somebody else because I can't do what God gave me to do if you put me in a bushel. All right, so, so when we look at our ministries, we should have things like this. We're going to do a little bit of a little. This is called a measurable goal, all right? When we have in, in our churches, we, have, we, we should have some kind of measurable goal. And it's a little bit of a difficult term to use because many of the things in our churches we measure, uh, but they are intrinsic measurements. In other, in other words, uh, whether or not a praise and worship team is meeting their measurable goal doesn't have to do with numbers. It has to do with an intrinsic sensing and an atmosphere. But some way we got to know, uh, we have to be able to measure whether or not the departments in our church are meeting their goal. Whatever that may be, whether it means we're going to add 50 more children, thusly families to the church, to the children's ministry, whether it means we want a particular atmosphere set by the praise and worship team, uh, whatever it means, we have to, that, this is up to you to find a way to measure that. When we have our departments then, and we have a measurable goal, we have things that we list under that. We have things like programs, yeah, policies, is that right, Kathy? Policies, procedures, huh? P-O-L-I. See, that's what I'm saying. This is my, I had a public school education. That's why I was asking. <laughs> One E, pro procedure? E-D, procedure. Y'all work with me. Okay. Programs, policies, procedures, uh, plans, yeah, and people. This is kind of what makes up our departments. I really don't spell very well, so forgive me. But anyway, so here we go. So we have, so we have a measurable goal. The reason that in all of, our, all of our areas we have programs. These are things that we run through the church, things that we're doing, things that we're moving, things that we're, you know, that's not what we sometimes as pastors do. We're pushing all the programs, and we're doing this and this, and we've got the programs. And we have policies the way that all of those programs function. You know, this is how it rolls. And then we have the procedures in what order and things that goes. These are our plans that we're making, and these are the people that we include into it. Now, the reason we need a measurable goal is that we have to then make sure that none of these things are at odds with our measurable goal. Because it's possible for you to set into motion policies and plans and procedures that are actually counterintuitive to the measurable goal. 
So, for example, one year in our church, uh, we had, a, we had a, a tons of babies being born, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> and so we, uh, some people were being a little distracting with their children. We have a nice nursery, and, you know, and I didn't want to stop the service, and, you know, because, you know, some babies would just cry and scream and set chairs on fire, and, and so... <laughs> And so we decided that we would institute a ministry in the church. And the ministry in the church would be that, uh, that we would find some nice motherly ladies in the church who, if a child started crying or making too much noise or distraction, would be able to then go to them and inform them that we had a nursery. And, uh, and so uh, the problem is, the problem is that now, it was my, it was my fault, the problem was I had given an assignment I'd given an assignment to some people that would leave feeling the service as if they had not functioned in their ministry on that day had they not told somebody to take that baby out of the service. And it was my fault. Because I'm the guy, I gave them the assignment. So they don't want to go home from church like I didn't even get to function in my ministry today. My ministry is to tell babies to get out of here. And I didn't get to tell no babies to get out of here. And so, and so it, got, it, it got to be so, all, so, so they're waiting for an opportunity to function in their ministry. And so a baby could just go, ah. and they jump up, buddy. They, they, they like a radar. Where's it at? Where's it at? And the baby wasn't being distracting. The baby was breathing. And so now, now they're going after the baby, take the baby out. Well, here was my goal. My goal... My goal was to produce a happy worship environment. Right. Yeah, but now I got mad, folks, because I got mean women chasing babies out of the church. <laughs> so we had to change the policies because the policy was working against what I was trying to do. So we're trying to get an atmosphere of free praise and worship where people can be released, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and all those kind of things. And so, but back in those days, back in those days, all of our worship team came to church very formally, like we were going to a wedding or to a ball or to a reception. And the guys would come in in three-piece suits and the ladies with long dresses and it looked like, you know, it looked like prom. And... <laughs> And so, and so then I'm up there and I'm telling them the measurable goal here, the goal is to have an atmosphere of breakthrough. So I'm telling them, get free, get loose, come on, guys, you know, let's go. Break it down, push it out there, open the heavens. And, and they're like, it's hard to do that in a tuxedo. <laughs> you know, and so our dress code was actually working against what our goal was. So the goal, the goal is to have a free atmosphere. The goal is not to look good on pictures, you know. And so, so many churches I go to, they design their platform only so that it looks good on pictures rather than so that it's functional. And the singers can't hear the instruments and the instruments don't know where the singers are at and people are all separated. So it looks nice and aesthetic, but no one can get the goal done. It looks great on pictures, but it sounds terrible. Okay, so the goal is not to look good on pictures. The goal is to function. Put the stuff where the stuff needs needs to be so you can get done what you're trying to do, all right? So you have to check with your policies, all right? So you have your procedures and your plans. Anyway, by the time you get done checking all of these things off, uh, where you end up at is this right here, people. Let's talk about some people. Church would be awesome if it wasn't for all them people. <laughs> people Be because the new wine is found in the cluster so the spirit of our church the spirit of our church will be designed around the people that we include into the cluster because you can't get a sweet spirit from sour grapes Because people will bring their spirits into your cluster. And wines are defined by the kind of grapes that you use. And so if you use sour grapes, you're going to get a sour spirit. And most people will change the task to fit their style. Then they will change their style 
to fit the task. So they're going to take what revelation God gave you and squeeze it into the way that they like to do stuff. But culture is the way we do it here. I'm not talking about your last church. I'm talking about the way we do it here. I'm not talking about what you do at your house. I'm not talking about how your grandma's church does. I'm talking about the way, no, no, the, the way we do it here. You understand? And this may be more important than you, than, than you, you think because here's what happens in our churches. We get gifted people, but they're not trained. And I'm trained. Okay, so let me talk to you for, the, for a minute about the difference between train and time. Because I used to think that the way you train people is you spend a lot of time with them. And I found out that time equals relationship. But time does not equal training. Because here comes a revelation. Some people get it, and some people don't. And I don't care how much time you spend with some people, they don't get it. It's not my job to figure out why you don't get it. I don't know whether you were raised by a nuclear power plant, whether you weren't breastfed as a child, whether somebody stole your bicycle. I don't know. But you don't get it, okay? And I don't know why. It's not my job. So you have to have trained people. Trained people have the ability to apply information. That's what being trained is. You have the ability to apply information. So I used to think that you could train people. You could train people. Because here's what happens. People come to our church, they have giftings, but they're not trained. So they say to us, I love to work with children. Okay, but this is not Sesame Street. <laughs> right? This is not your daycare that you run out of your house there is a way we do it here so we have certain protocols we have certain plans we have certain policies we have certain procedures and there's a way we want it done we don't even really care what your favorite style of music is if you want to join the team up here it does not matter it does not matter what your favorite style of music is when you get home you get your favorite style of music and turn it up loud as you want to and act crazy don't nobody care but over here over here there is a way we do it here so you can't take your style and try to impose it upon what God has given us to do. We have a vision. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, here we go. Here we go. McDonald's has evangelized the world. The golden arches have reached the four corners. You can go any place in the world just about and see a McDonald's. And the interesting thing about McDonald's is wherever you go, you know what you're going to get. Because they got a way, they do it there. You see what I'm talking about? We, you, you can, and it's amazing how it can stir in you. We, you were talking about Sun, uh, Sunday at Elijah, and we were over in uh, that part of the world one time preaching for him, and then we had taken a bus way out, way, way out there in the middle of nowhere, going from one town in Bulgaria to another place in the East Block, wherever we're at. We're way out there in the middle of nowhere. And the people had treated us nice and fed us wonderful and all that kind of thing. We're traveling late night in a bus, and we were all out there in the middle of nowhere, and we came up over a hill and saw them golden arches, and I felt the Holy Ghost rise up in my soul. I said, oh, how y'all my head. I just want to raise my hand and thank God for Ronald McDonald right here. And, and it was just because, it was just because, you know, there was something that we were used to. We wanted some food that we were familiar with. And we got in there. We were so happy. People was getting extra Big Macs. And here's the thing. You, you, you know, you know when, when you walk into a McDonald's, you know that a Big Mac is two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what a McDonald's hamburger is. Right? And it's the same all over the world. I know you're having problems with it. Just roll with me now, Pastor, because he, he won't eat no McDonald's. But we're going we're gonna to break him down before it's over with. All right, so... So, do you know, I have eaten McDonald's in Toledo, Ohio, Detroit, Michigan, Denver, Colorado, 
San Jose, California, Pretoria, South Africa, Cape Town. I have eaten Big Macs from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. <laughs> I have eaten Big Mac, and every Big Mac I have ever eaten is two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. You know why? That's the way they do it there. So when you go to work, so when you go to work for McDonald's, they don't ask you, how do you like to make hamburgers at your house? They did not allow you to work at McDonald's because they think you got a good idea on how you can make the Big Mac better. What they say is you go look out there on that sign. It says 90 billion people sir we don't need no ideas for you to tell us how to improve on the big mac don't matter to us if when your mama used to go get you a big mac that she put her special sauce. we don't care about your mama's special sauce we got our own sauce this the way we do it here and we put fries in the deep fryer and we got a timer on it so you know when to bring the fries out of the deep fryer. There's a little buzzer on it after about three minutes and 20 some seconds that goes beep, beep. That means bring the fries up out the deep fryer. We don't care if your mama made yours extra crispy for you, if she was a spud frying mammy. We don't care nothing about if she raised 12 kids on some potatoes. Over here, you gonna bring those fries up out the deep fryer because that's the way we do it here. here. So when you're at your house and you want to play American Idol, get you a brush and stand in front of the mirror and sing what you want to. But when you come here, we're going to do it the way God has given to us and the vision that has come from the man and the woman of God. And we're going to have our children taught and taken care of the way that God has given to our leaders. The camera's going to work the way we want them to work. The light's going to be the way they want them to be. The sound's going to be the way they want them to be because that's the way we do it here. You got it? Now, I have to break things down because, see, the thing about time is most of the time in churches, what we do is we use people that we have a relationship with rather than people who are trained. Mm-hmm. And a relationship is simply the interaction of one or more things. And so our relationship can go like this. I give you something to do, you mess it up, I come behind it and fix it. That's our relationship. And it's been that way for a long time. We used to be proud in our church of how long it took people to get involved. We were proud of it. It took, a, it took a year. It took a year to get involved. And we were proud of it. People say, oh, I want to get in there. Well, you can't just walk in our man. No, 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 no. You had to go through some classes. You got six weeks of foundation stones, ten weeks of first principles. Then we got the fourth kind of leadership. And we got whatever. It took you a year's worth of classes to get involved in our church because we thought if we spent enough time with you that you were going to get it. But I found out some people could come in. You could explain it to them in two or three sessions, and they got it. Other people, after a year, they don't get it. Now, we have a relationship but they don't get it so why do I have to penalize the people that get it to sit in a class with the slow learners for the rest of the year because you don't get it so I just decided that we weren't going to do that so so we we would teach people all these things we just don't want to take, take forever to get involved in our church you know and then after after a year they come out they still don't follow the protocols they still don't do it right because they don't they don't get it they don't get it and so now they get into a department and they mess everything up so i had to get them out of there so i started a new class called the next level <laughs> And we would go to them and we'd say, we have a class for you called the, I didn't say whether it was up or down, but this is your next <laughs> level. So we have all these people we have a relationship with, but they're not trained because they don't have an ability to follow 
information. They don't have the ability to apply information. So we have, to, we have to decide now how we're dealing with people. Okay, just try it with me because for me, I have to break things down into like a binary thing. It's either one thing or the other because if you break something down into a binary code, then it kind of removes all the ambiguities out of it. It makes you make a decision. For example, I call a department, this is deep now, I call a department either up or down. Ain't that deep? <laughs> so if I'm looking at a department, I have to say, okay, if, if I'm asked, it's either up. If, a, if the department is up, that means it is meeting its goals. Mm -hmm. If it is down, it means it's not. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> so, because what it does is it helps you because you say, is, is the children's ministry up or down? Well, see, then that, that way you've got to take out all that, well, you know, they're really good people and they're trying. They're so faithful. And I, I tell you what, I just don't know why. Okay, but, but is it up or down? Is we is or is we ain't, right? Is we up or is we down? So because some people think faithfulness is doing something that doesn't work for a long time. And they say... <laughs> They say, brother so-and-so, he's so faithful. He is so faithful. He is, he's taught those 10 men for 30 years. He ain't faithful. The Bible said that he's a wicked servant. If you read the parables of the kingdom, if you return something back to Jesus in the same measure that he gave it to you in, you are not faithful. He gave it to you to multiply. So it's either up or it's down. Everybody say up. I just want to make sure you're still breathing. Or down. Yeah, or down. Everybody still breathing. So this is how departments work. Now here, here comes the problem. And I have to preface this because I know that we're new to each other and everything. So this, this, because I have to then do the same with people. Because the new wine is found in the cluster. So I have to say as a person, they are either up or down. And so I will pause here for a disclaimer to let you know that this has nothing to do with whether or not Jesus loves them. This has nothing to do with whether or not their eternal soul is in jeopardy. This has nothing to do with their intrinsic value as a human being. It has to do with whether or not you can do anything. Because an up person can get stuff done. A down person can't. I don't know why. It's just so. Some people, you can give them something to do, and they get it done. Other people, you give them things to do, and you know when you give it to them, it ain't going to get done. Matter of fact, they're going to create more work for me, right? So again, before I continue, Jesus loves them. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves them. Everybody got that? Wave at me. This, this has to do with the way that I have to put it into my brain to figure out, can you do anything or not? So, I would, so then I have to take people and I break it down into a couple categories. M-O-T stands for motivation. A-B-L-E stands for ability. Now, we only have a few options for, to be specific. That is, you can be motivated and not able. Mm -hmm. Or you can be not motivated and able. Or you can be not motivated and not able. Or you can be motivated and able. That's the only options we got. <laughs> only options we got. So somebody says, brother so-and-so wants to get involved in a particular department. Then the people of that department have to then regulate. Okay, where is he at? Most people in the church are here. They're motivated but not able. I just want to do something for God. Pastor, I feel like God's calling me to be your personal assistant secretary. Can you type? No. Okay. Motivated but not able. Have you ever heard a person sing in church that was highly motivated? <laughs> Highly motivated here, not so much. So churches are filled with people 
who are motivated but not able. There are other people in the church, they're not very motivated, but they are able. The reason we have to use these people is because these people are not motivated. We have all kinds of people that could do a better job at what we're doing if we could just get you to be motivated. So now we're over here using these people who are motivated, but they're not able, and now you're picking them apart because you know how to do it, but you are. So, so you're not motivated, but you are able. Now, the way that I deal with people has to be based on where I find them. So if you're motivated but not able, then I have to train you. If you're able but not motivated, I have to encourage you. If you're not motivated and not able, I have to get rid of you. (laughs) And if you are motivated and able, then I delegate to you. So what ultimately what we're trying to get is people who are motivated and able so that we can delegate to them because they want to do it and they can do it and they will do it. These folks here, just, just, this, is, this is wasting. I'm sorry. Jesus loves these people. <laughs> I'm just telling you, they can't do nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this right here ain't getting nothing done. Right here. That's what we do right there. Praise the Lord. So, (laughs) now it's interesting, Bishop Huskins and I were noticing today, it's interesting in every church you have people that you rely on because they're motivated and able. And you can see the teams around. I saw the young man up here, he was singing, and then later on he's over there on the video. And then he's leading us to the back room. And then he's over here, the young man that was over here, you know. And evidently that tells me he's relied on because evidently he can get stuff done. And I saw your daughter up here, she's singing, and then she's over there, and then somebody's cooking in the back. And you, you know, and Judah's over there picking somebody up in the airport, and he's moving this thing over here. And he's over here, my God, he's playing the bass too. That child's everywhere. And then he's out there and, and over here. And you know, every church has people that you rely on, every ministry has people that you rely on because, because they get stuff done. So now we have to define, and then I'll be done, we have to define our down people. Yeah, what a shame. Because down people have similar characteristics that you might be interested in, all right? Down people, number one, are excuse makers. Excuse makers. Now this is interesting because with a down person, all they have to have, they they, they ain't thinking about the measurable goal. All they have to do is have something to say as to why it didn't get done, and they're okay with it, even if it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't have to make any sense. They just have to have something to say. And you could tell them... um, I want all the, all, all the front chair, take the, all the front rows out, you know. And then you come back later, and they're just walking around shaking hands with people, happy, <laughs> yeah, you know, and all the chairs are still there. And so you say to them, I thought I told you to move the front row. And they'll say something like, yeah, they had Bibles on them. <laughs> what does that mean? And it doesn't have to make any sense. You tell the sound person, you know, I'm like, I'm, the sound is off. The sound is always off. And they said, well, you know, Saturn is kind of lined up now with the, uh, with the Southern Cross. And it's kind of shifting with the humidity that the people are throwing into the... A- what are you talking? I just want to be heard. You know? Excuse maker. They don't, they don't even care. They just have to have something to say. All right? Down people have no ability to introspect. They never look inward. Hmm. It's always out there. It's always somebody else. And they get up and they sing. I'm just picking on singers today. And uh, by the way, the band and the praise team sounds great around here. God bless you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Doing great. So, but this is kind of like a visible thing that we can all see. So, you know, somebody gets up to sing, and it's not really all that good, you know, and we know it. And and so they say, um, if the people would have got with me, well, perhaps if you had picked a song in your range, um, one that you knew the words to, and uh, if you could kind of hold a melody, 
then maybe people would have gotten with you. But their first response is out. They never look in to say, how could I have made it better? What can I do? What is my responsibility? Down people do not do this. It's always somebody else. And the first word out of their mouth is they or somebody else's name. Um, how come we didn't get this done? Well, so, you know, it, rather than I, rather than my bad, I dropped the ball. I could have done that better. I misunderstood you. It's always they did. She said, somebody told me. They have no ability to introspect, which leads us to the next one then, because down people live in the land of pretend. Down people live in the land of pretend. That means they act like stuff is good when it's not. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows it's no good, but we have to pretend that it is. And if you pretend long enough, you'll come to church one day, and they're going to pretend you're a pastor, and you can pretend they're a congregation, and you can pretend that you had a good service, and you can go home, and it won't be any good. But you can all pretend. But new people coming into your church ain't going to pretend. They're going to walk in and go, that ain't no pastor. That ain't no church. You know what pretend people are? Yeah, I feel like I just stepped on something there, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to continue. Uh, pretend. Um, I have had messages that I preached. <laughs> I've had messages that I preached that I have forbid them to sell the master. <laughs> because it was terrible. It's terrible. I have preached some things that have sent me into uh, a Sunday afternoon quandary as to the purpose of my life. <laughs> I would preach something, it would be so bad until I'm staring out the window telling Kathy, I could do other things. I, I, I don't know what I was talking about. And I was saved before I started preaching that message. Now I don't know who God is. I would just totally confuse my whole self. And so that, because I knew it was bad, but at least I knew. But I'm going to walk past two or three down people on the way out that's going to go, Bishop, that was, oh, shut up. You know it was sorry, and so do I. Kathy's always trying to encourage me, but she knows we don't live in the land of pretend, and we all know when it's bad. And so I'll say, that was a terrible message. She goes, you gave it a go. Your suit looked nice, but the message was sorry, okay? So, you know, we, we had a Sunday one time when I did, like, tryouts for the choir and praise team on a Sunday morning. This was early on in our church, and maybe this time we had maybe 800, 900 people coming, and, and it, were, it wasn't good. And so I came in, and I said, okay, you guys can stop. And um, I, I asked the congregation, how many of you know this is not good? Just raise your hand. And so they raised their hands. Yeah, because we knew it wasn't good. And so I said to the choir, how many of you know that it's not good? And they were like, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want them to pretend. Everybody knew it wasn't good, you know. I could see the pain. I, I feel the, your pain right there. Like, we're not allowed to say that. But it's, it just, everybody knows it wasn't any good. The Holy Spirit was running. For, I mean, it was fine until they started singing. And then it was like angels packing up. and shoo. You know, we're going to the church down the street where they can sing. So I said, I said we, what we need to do is set everybody down and we're going, to have, we're going to have tryouts right here. And so if you can sing and you like to have, just come on down. Put somebody on the piano. Let's play something everybody knows. Amazing Grace, hallelujah, you are awesome, this place, mighty God. Or, you know, something. And, uh, and come on down, and if you sing like a bullfrog or something like that, then don't come. And so, we, you know, we just kind of did that. And so I would, I'm not suggesting that you do that. That's not a good thing to do. But anyhow, I taught the church to come out of the land of pretend because down people will pretend that things are good when they're not. All right. Down people, give you two more or so. Down people have a thing I call crooked. Is that right? Crooked. Crooked communication. 
Cricket communication, that's a C, y'all. Cricket communication means that they have the inability to communicate something accurately. So if I go to a down person and say to them, this is what you need to help say to your department, by the time they get done repeating what I told them, it doesn't sound anything like what I told them. And you say, all I need you to do is, would you please go and tell the ushers to meet me in the foyer? And I'm in the foyer by myself. Because by the time they got done with it, Bishop wants to meet with you after service in the parking lot. You know what I mean? It's just like, by the time they get done, they can't, they can't get it right. Commu- cricket communication. Two more and then I'm done. Uh, they have a thing called variance. You know, variance. Variance means uh, no matter what we give them to do, they're going to change it. They're going to vary and vary, which doesn't mean anything so much if it's one little thing, but when you're organizing a service and you have movable parts and this person varies and then that person varies and then that person varies and that person varies, then we miss our target. Okay? So it could be simple like this. You say, I've seen this happen a hundred times in churches. You say, uh, here's what's going to happen. Brother so-and-so is going to receive the offering. The offering is received. Lights will go down. The lights go down, that's the cue, play the video. When the video is over, choir, you sing, yeah, and then the word is coming. Easy, simple, right? Offering, lights, video, choir, preaching. Easy. Until people start varying. And now the person is done with the offering. And the person running the lights is like, We've already told you, but now you're looking for a confirmation. So they're back there. Should they turn them down or not turn them? Turn them. And you know how like 30 seconds in a church can seem like, for, would you just turn the lights off? And now they've got everybody off, off kilter now because the lights are on. So the choir director thinks, they're not going to play the video. So the choir director says, time to sing. Oh, they start singing about the same time the video hits. And now the video and the choir are competing with each other. So the choir stops, but so does the video. And now we have nothing, but now the lights go off. And now nobody knows what to do. Who's on first? And they wrecked the whole program just because they had to vary. Change it up. So, okay, last point. Down people are suppressive personality types. That means they can't celebrate you. Down people may smile in your face when the church blesses you and buys you a new car, but inside they're mad about it. Suppressive people cannot celebrate the success of somebody else because there's something broke on the inside of you that makes you think somebody else's success is the cause of your failure. And it didn't have anything to do with your failure. It has to do with your down in your down self. And so anytime someone else does good, uh, anytime someone else is elevated, they can't celebrate that fact. You want to mess up a down person that's got an attitude problem? Ask them what you're doing good and watch them go into tongues. Hey, tell me what you like good about what we're doing over here at this church. Because they don't have compliments because they got an issue. It's hard for them to open their mouth and just say, you're doing a great job. God bless you for putting the conference on. It's people, I promise you, if I know anything about church numbers anywhere, it's got to be one or two or three of you running around here this week. Man, don't like this. And this man and woman of God have organized with their team some of the most awesome stuff. But I promise you, it's a couple around here going like, well, what have you done with your down self? What have you done? And so, you know, so, so, the point becomes, the point becomes, I'm quitting here, the point becomes, am I good on time, Pastor? 
I'm, I'm done in just a few minutes, for real. For real. If a church, a church ultimately is up, a church, a church is up or down. Now, you can have many departments in the church. While a church is up, they're still down, some up, some up, some down, children's ministry up and down, you know. At all, at all given times, we have some ministries that are meeting their goals and some that are not, you know. But as a whole, the church is either up or it's down. Right? Yeah. So the point becomes that a lot of the people in the world are down. And that's okay. You can have down people in your department if you have an up person over them. Let me tell you what happens. If you put a down person over a bunch of up people, pretty soon the up people will walk out of that department because they're tired of pretending that we're good when we're not good. I'm tired of bringing my kids from across town when we were eating and running them home to put them in their Christmas costume for the play only to get to the church for the third time in the road to find out you stuck a note on the door that said choir, the rehearsal is canceled. I just spent an hour and a half getting over here, but it don't mean nothing to you with your down self because you out having a pizza party. You ain't even thinking about it. You don't care that you have inconvenienced 30 families in the church that have other stuff to do and got to get them kids put up in their stuff and you understand what I'm talking about and so guess what happens next time you with your down self try to do a play all of the up people are gonna leave you with a bunch of down people and then you're gonna come to rehearsal and they gonna stick their notes on the door ain't coming tonight got stuff to do and you won't be able to get that play off the ground and preachers get tired because we spend our life propping down people to make them look like they're up rather than getting some up people to be over the down people mm-hmm And when a church, when a church gets down, when a church is down, the up people walk out of it. And when the up people walk out of a church, it ain't coming back up. It is not. It's not coming back up unless it has a new pastor, a sovereign move of God, somebody burns the building down and builds another one in its place changes the name, something has to happen because when the church goes down, it ain't coming back up. One of my greatest joys over life is to watch people that have come into my ministry with a victimized, excuse-making, doing nothing, done nothing, critical attitude and be down and sit up under the word and God take them from being down and make them up. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in God. He is the glory, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. He has the power to raise us up. Every direction towards God is up. He takes you higher and he lifts you higher. So I say to you, find your up people. Find them. Motivate them. Give them something to do, but just remember that your new wine is found in the cluster. And if you don't like the spirit of your church, get some different people involved. And I would suggest get the up people involved in your church. God bless you. Bye, bye, bye.